Ranjit, can you unmute, please? Can you hear? <coughs> Hello, can you hear? Yeah. Uh, so today I have been reading the book Models of the Mind, How Physics, Engineering and Mathematics Have Shaped Our Understanding of the Brain by Grace Lindsay. Uh, okay, so, so your screen is not visible. Oh, you have to share this thing. Yeah, so. yeah, now it's visible. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, so Grace Lindsay is an assistant professor in psychology and data science at NYU. Uh, her research is more focused on building mathematical models, exploring sensory processing. <coughs> and she was awarded a Google PhD fellowship in computational and neuroscience in 2007. So before getting into the book, I just want to say that this book was very technically heavy uh, because it covered a lot of topic and very little uh, pages. And from because it covered uh, brain in, in itself and all the parts of the brain, like motion, how motion is happening, how vision, everything, and it, it also talked about memory, how it is formed, and it talk, even talked about consciousness, which is again a very big topic. So I couldn't really uh, get everything out of it. Maybe if I read it two or three times, and I guess that's the uh, purpose of book reading really, to understand. And I also wanted to say that um, I talked with Dr. Shalling this before. Like I never really, uh, when I started it, I uh, when I started in AIC, I, I did not understood the role of Dr. Shalling in in this computers uh, in this lab and how she had uh, how is she part of the and and then after going through a lot of uh, you know uh, meetings and all, I realized she is one of the most central part of this whole lab and reading this book actually solidified that understanding in a in a way so the so the um, book started with uh, how uh, with mathematics in itself and the, the whole book is a, is about an interplay between mathematics neuroscience cognitive science etc so it's uh, the whole book has a theme of mathematics and uh, how it is one of the most central part of uh, uh, any uh, science so um, for in her words mathematics she calls this an extended cognition which means that like our brain cannot maybe may not be able to process everything in uh, in itself so we use mathematics as a tool to effectively uh, you know extend our cognition to near uh, so that we don't have to do everything on our own so uh, she also talks about something called this concept of emergence which is uh, uh, which is the fact that uh, the brain in itself is, or any complex um, mechanism cannot be understood by individual uh, parts of the uh, thing. So we may not be able to understand the uh, whole functionality of brain just by saying uh, this part of the brain works in that way. So that may not be a way to go. Uh, so uh, the book starts with uh, the concept that um, it, even though every uh, other science has, um, you know, taken our mathematics as a very, very, very big tool to understand it, biology has been one of the late, last to embrace mathematics as a tool because most of them believed mathematics to be either too simple, which may not be represent the whole by, uh, you know, the nature in itself, or it's either too complex or which makes. Uh, which is complex, uh, you know, numbers, which doesn't make much sense in the biological sense. So uh, the title of the introductory chapter is spherical cow, which is a job that is going around. Uh, I don't know if it will work in here. So basically the joke is that um, a farmer wanted to uh, uh, know why his cow was not producing enough milk. So uh, he had been he had been getting trouble of because of that. So he approached his phys, uh, friend who is a physics professor. So physics professor thought about it for a, a lot of 
time and finally he come up with this solution so he comes the solution started with the fact that assume a spherical cow of uniform density and in a vacuum space so basically uh, the fact that uh, the uh, the fact that it is being uh, put forward is the fact uh, is is that we always try to simplify over simplify and make assumptions and all and that may not work for a field like biology what is mean? sorry what is mean? Sorry, is the name of the song? Oh, no, <laughs> the sound effects. The, the, the sound effects. <laughs> What's her name again? I'm sorry, Ranger. What Grace you Lindsay. Grace Lindsay. Okay, I'm looking her up. I couldn't find her. Okay. So that's how it starts, uh, how mathematics became a part of it. And uh, it slowly started to emerge and we started to embrace mathematics in the biology. So uh, next, we talk about something called as a spike or an action potential, which is basically <coughs> that uh, the changes in the electrical properties of a cell while uh, while some a neuron is getting fired. So, uh, so this whole chapter was a history of first. Um, uh, we never we did not believe in the fact that it, it, uh, our body can produce electricity and then later on with galvanometer and thing uh, you know property uh, like with experience we were able to finally uh, finally be able to uh, you know get that uh, you know fixed up on so uh, she talks about this Hodgkin Huxley model which is uh, again a model which talks about the uh, which is more biological, uh, which talks about the uh, how this whole action potential happens. That is, in neurons there is sodium and potassium, etc. And then when a neuron gets fired, the changes in uh, the sodium and uh, potassium uh, states in, inside and outside the neuron happens, and how this relates to uh, you know getting it fired or not. But one important, uh, one interesting thing that I noticed was this principle, all or nothing principle, which basically uh, means that a, the neuron gets either fired or it doesn't. There is nothing like a, a neuron gets half fired or one by four fired or it fi gets fired more. Uh, so it has a threshold and after the threshold it fires and if, it, if, if <coughs> the threshold is doesn't reach, it just doesn't fire. That so basically one and zero. Yeah. Sorry? Basically one and zero? Yeah, one and zero. <clears throat> so the next one or two chapters talk, talks about uh, how a artificial intelligence was uh, developed in itself. Uh, so again, uh, it talks from the base of uh, developing muscle uh, bits model, which are two, if I'm not wrong, psychologists or cognitive scientists. And they developed this model of uh, a Boolean uh, logics, uh, which creates Boolean logics. And then, uh, uh, then he, she talked about perceptrons, which is like an addition to the Macaulay's Fitz neuron, which gives itself gives the inputs weights and it learns itself. And then we talked about multi multi layer perceptron. Uh, and then uh, back propagation, which was uh, developed by jo Jeffrey Hinton, and then which leads to a lot of uh, you know what we see, which I which what we see nowadays, including diffusion models or anything. So this chapter was whole uh, completely history of AI, which I don't think is much relevant to. Okay. So next, uh, she talks about memory. And majorly, why do we remember what we remember? So she initially starts with uh, this uh, this concept, uh, so this uh, different parts of memory like uh, the long term memory, short term memory, working memory, etc. And how this memory is being formed, and how we can retrieve this memory. Uh, yeah, uh, how we can retrieve this memory. So, so memory is getting formed. For that, she use this theory called synaptic plasticity theory. Uh, she talked about this theory where uh, the synapsis is the region between two neurons and whenever a neurons get fired as uh, information gets transferred, these, uh, this area gets strengthened each time like the waves get strengthened and that is how uh, 
you know, uh, that is how memory is getting formed. And she, if I'm not wrong, she also talked about some indexing and how it was memory is getting formed. Uh, now, coming to the retrieval of the memory, uh, she used this I found very interesting is the Hoffel network, which is a network uh, which means that, uh, which I can show you, uh, tell you by an example. Like, let's say uh, you walk into a room and you see your uh, childhood bed or uh, uh, your childhood chair or something. Uh, then you can retrieve the whole memory of your childhood room just from that. You don't have to see the entire room in itself to retrieve the memory. So that is what uh, is being done in this, uh, this being explained this in this home field network, which is the fact that how a full memory can be retrieved from a part of it. Like a part of when we see a, a, like a, a chair or a bed, we are, uh, we are firing that neurons, but in, in turn, we are firing the neurons which are, you know, near to it and then that gets uh, involved and we can see the whole memory. And I feel this can be used in, uh, you know, anything like, and I, I believe this is something uh, which even, even in, uh, this is similar to uh, like a relate, uh, like I could relate this to uh, relative person encoding or how we can use this to, uh, you know, uh, uh, like in join opening, we talked about how part of a chair can retrieve the whole chair. So I don't know, I could relate both of these together. So uh, this is basically Hoffel network and uh, they talked about something called as an attractor, which is uh, again with an example, let's say you're in a trampoline and so you're standing in that. So there is a you know, dip in that where you're standing. So let's if you put a ball in somewhere in the trampoline, then the ball gets attracted to this uh, to us because of the dip. So, which basically means that uh, when you fire a neuron with uh, this uh, uh, this chair or a uh, this childhood bed or a chair, then we are basically attracting it to the nearest memory that we could find, which is the room. So that is being talked in uh, how we can retrieve the memory. Uh, so. Then she also talked about working memory, which is uh, which is basically uh, let's say I wanted to remember the color of that uh, chair uh, or that cushion, and uh, so uh, uh, and after after a minute or two, I want to retrieve that. So how are, how is the memory being able to keep that memory even when I look away from it? So that is being done by working memory and. Uh, uh, this is being described in a ring network, basically in ring network. Uh, so in Hoffel network, every memory is distinct from each other, like uh, the memory of this place is distinct from the memory of my room apartment or so. But in working memory, the, the ring network, everything is kind of connected to each other. So uh, the memory uh, that I, uh, let's say I get from, uh, uh, so when I get from uh, this cushion, when I, after two minutes, if I look away, it will not get, you know, moved away, but so we can still be able to retrieve it from the working memory. So, yeah. Uh, okay. So, I mean, I'll tell you just a quick question. Yeah. Is there a reason of, you know, connecting the network field here? Because software network, network, etc. At least on network field, right? So why is she, you know, some she draws analogy with the network field? Uh, so she uh, she suggests that this is what how uh, brain, uh, how uh, the memory in the brain is getting. So, so my it's a retrieval cue. It's a no, retrieval cue. Uh, she just used some network field names to draw analogy, or she has. Solid scientific evidence of uh, saying this. This is a ring so network. There is, as far as I understand, there is not much of a very significant scientific understanding. Okay. But okay. this is what uh, she thinks of that. Wait, wait a minute. So think more here. So there is evidence at the algorithmic level, uh -huh. behavioral level, that contents are related that you can use 
a small piece of information to retrieve related content. And we have a whole algorithmic notion of spreading activation at the behavioral level. I don't know about the neuroscience level, which is where she's talking. I don't know about that. No, no, I understand. My question is ring network is a specific network. Mm -hmm. And so now when she is saying, you know, working memory is a ring network. Is but that a personal she's the, making or there is a scientific proof for that? I, I, I don't know, but I we did talk about how you know stuff <clears> is <throat> gathered into working memory, seven plus or minus two, and the those contents are all in the focus of attention. We talked about that at the algorithmic level. I don't know at the neuroscience level. Oh, they, there are uh, scientific studies present at neuroscience level. A better example of this will be like uh, when you forgot your keys in your living room and uh, you try to find it out as soon as you enter in your living room. Each event, when you entered, when you keep the keys at in the living room anywhere, it gets repeating and you remember that. You recall that where you have kept the uh, kept your keys. So it is it is a neuroscience, it's reinst uh, reinstated at recall. And there are like uh, several theories behind it. And it's proved like it's it, there are studies which can tell that uh, the neuroscience level, that hippocampus and cortex level where these neurons are getting created and where it is firing actually. Okay, uh, so that's what is about uh, memory, and then uh, in in this whole chapter, she talks about something called uh, excitatory uh, inputs and inhibitory inputs. So basically, um, uh, the neurons in our body are noisy. So that means that uh, the when we uh, look at the the activation of the or when it is being fired, the firing is not uh, done in a particular threshold all the time. So it is it it may fire at this threshold at one time. It may not fire it. Uh, so it has this randomness associated with uh, with it. And not only this randomness is associated with it, the brain kind of uh, pushes for this randomness. So there has been uh, several uh, hypotheses for this. One of us is uh, the uh, the notion of free will uh, and uh, so that we are so the no neurons we are able to in, uh, so the in inputs we are able to influence the neurons but we are not able to control the neurons in itself so we have that uh, the other is the fact that randomness create uh, it improves the knowledge and you know uh, we are uh, so if we go in the same path every time we don't really learn anything but if, if we strive away from the path we are able to learn and we are able to go. So, uh, so the so the basic premise is that uh, uh, the in the inputs in the neurons is always either an excitatory input <coughs> or the inhibition. The excitatory input as in the neuron makes it uh, the input makes it the neuron to fire. Inhibition as in uh, it will not it kind of quiets it down. So, and this is very important, and it's kind of like a tug of war that both the inputs, oh, okay, uh, both the inputs are very important. Uh, like we cannot have the neurons to fire all the time because then it, uh, it, 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 it will be a very big energy load, and we cannot have it, uh, you know, uh, be silent all the time. So we always need to have this balance and this uh, balance between excitatory and inhibitory uh, inputs. And uh, for patients like uh, this, uh, having seizures, uh, it is uh, it is shown that uh, this uh, this randomness is not there. That is why the people have seizures. That is uh, the neurons get fired, or like uh, all the neurons get in unison and fire, or it gets silent. So that there is, if you see the EEG, there is like a sudden spike and sudden discharge. Uh, so that is because of the fact that. These excitatory and inhibitory neurons are not, uh, inputs are not being done properly. Uh, so then she has a, a whole chapter dedicated to the special cortex and how the whole uh, computer uh, convolutional neural networks is uh, being developed and how uh, it was developed from the beginning. So it was, it began with template matching, but basically it's like I, 
I believe it's like a ground truth and we have an image and we squirts multiplied and if it is the same then we have the image and if it is not it's not so then uh, later on we uh, go into neo cognitron which which i believe is one of the initial uh, convolution neural network uh, even though the name was given uh, is by yan lee kohn and uh, lenet uh, so neo cognitron uh, and the lenet i guess the only difference that i found was that uh, cnn uses back propagation algorithm to improve the weights and then give an output you know, the doesn't use that and uh, it's just uh, other than that everything else it, it does the same thing so the the feature is extracted by the cells and then it is being uh, you know combined by the c cells and it is used for recognition as well so this uh, cnn by andy uh, kind of the lanet uh, the first architecture which was done by andy kind of does the image recognition at scale and then later on we all know and it, it just talks about the history uh, where it uh, starts with Lenet and then we change that 2012 uh, kind of being the whole image net uh, the competition by a huge margin and then you know the, what's the, the other name not, not Lenet not Elliot not Elliot Lenet yes really okay yes I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't either. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm stunned. <laughs> yeah. So it, the whole chapter talks about the history of uh, CNN and how it came about uh, from Lena to Vijayina to uh, Alexnet and things like that. So basically, the whole architecture is uh, is similar uh, is the basic CNN itself, but it's just more data and more, uh, more layers and things like that. You know, there's a little sleight of hand going on here, and I was going to mention this earlier, but now now, now it's like really hitting me yeah. in the face. The previous discussion about memory uh -huh. was all about episodic memory. You're, and remember, we made the distinction between episodic memory and semantic uh -huh. memory. And now, once you get into recognition, now we're slipping into semantic memory and <coughs> that's a different kettle of fish. Yeah, I just, I, when I, uh, when he was um, explaining about it, I, at that time I wrote it that it was episodic memory in the chat. <laughs> yeah. And um, like after episodic memory, there is cementing and then aging. These three types of memories come like, in the chapter of uh, remembering in neuroscience. So then she briefly talks about uh, motion and how it is being connected to uh, the, the brain and uh, the basically she yeah. talks about uh, the motor neuron. She, talk, she talks about motor neurons, uh, which is in the motor cortex and how it is being, how it is processing the, uh, uh, the motion in the human body, how its motion is being connected. So one thing I, again, I found interesting is uh, this law dimensional models, which are simplified mathematical models, which can capture the essential features of movement while reducing the complexity. So basically, uh, the motion uh, is done by hundreds of neurons and to make that in hundred in a hundred dimensional space is very very difficult so we have we kind of make it low dimensional models uh using techniques like she talks about pca and all and uh we kind of reduce into a low dimensional model so that it can still capture the essence uh while you know having it in the low dimension so this chapter i it is kind of uh, interesting because it, I believe it is connected to the ASC connection. So graphs and connections. So basically, it talks about how uh, uh, how this uh, the whole uh, neurons are connected and how it is uh, how the connections are made and what kind of connection it is. So one of the things she talks about is the small world phenomena which is like highly clustered connection so let's see 
uh, in in social media there is like millions of connection but then each person is only connected to like the 400 500 like not not every person is connected to every other person so there is like highly clustered connection and uh, so this is something similar uh, this is the things which happens in brain itself so in brain everything is not connected to everything but there is like uh, there is like uh, hubs which uh, which does particular things and and uh, you know it connects each other so it's it's similar to this clustered connection and why it is so is because of this energy cost so connecting every neuron to every it's a very big energy consumption so we don't have to we don't uh, have that much energy so it's better to have this cluster highly clustered connection and the but how brain develops these connection uh, kind of differs from a graph theorist or a computer scientist so in uh, in, in when a computer scientist uh, start forms the graph connection we start from I, I believe we start from bottom up like we start from uh, bottom like without any connection and we try to make the minimum as minimum connections as possible like minimum path things like that but in when it comes to how brain is developed so when when we are uh, when we are conceived from till we are like three years old or so the brain connects every single thing and then kind of uh, removes those connections one by one and things like that and then uh, if, when we are uh, in the later stage of life like when we are old this connection gets removed uh, which leads to uh, like memory loss and things like that but basically it connects uh, everything but removes all the things so the connections how it is formed is kind of differs from I believe uh, how we kind of connect a computer scientist, how we connect our computer. But uh, I think uh, the whole idea which you mentioned, uh, everything yeah, is connected yeah. and then it's removed. Okay. That's what we do when we drop out in neural networks, right? Mm -hmm. New neural networks. We do drop outs to disconnect some of these uh, connections so okay. that the computation reduces. And even like handling the problem so overfitting into them. So I don't think it's it might be different from a graph theorist, but looking at uh, how we are trying to model this uh, neural networks, I think that's where you can find that synergy that dropout is being used to disconnect the connection. Just the sheet, the sheet connect the at all to the brain itself. So she says that this is how brain uh, anatomy in itself works. Like, uh, like not the development, but the clustered connections. This is how it is being. Uh, so each cluster has, uh, uh, like, has some functionality to work on. So it's not like everything work connects to everything. That's what she says in her. Yes, modularity. Yes. Processing pathways. Uh, then she also talks about how brain makes a rational decision. So uh, she talks about the uh, Bayer theorem and how is it being applied to biology and brain and things like that. So, uh, so Bayer theorem uh, basically needs to have a prior uh, and we need to have, uh, you know, uh, we need to have the evidence and then finally the results. So uh, let's say if you are. Uh, throwing a dice and we need to uh, know whether the, uh, uh, the dice is weighted uh, is being you know uh, is biased or not uh, so if the dice is being uh, is, is thrown three times and if it all gets two each time then it means that the uh, so the and we assume that the dice is weighted at one by third then the probability of uh, each time two is one by third into one by third into one, one by twenty seven. But if it is fair, then it is one by six into one by six into one. Third. So one by two one six. So there is a much bigger probability of it being uh, biased than it compared to when it is it is fair. So we we but we have to consider something called as prior. That is the prior information that we have. 
so let's say the opponent that i uh, so this is the example that she uses in the book so the opponent that we have is a very very close friend of mine then i can assure that then i have this prior information that she he or she doesn't cheat so i put the probability to be one by hundred but then if it is a very if it is a common man then uh you know i could he could be uh cheating so uh so we have to know the prior and we, we have to know what is happening and then to get the problem uh so but then there is an interesting discussion on how this prior is being formed how do we know that how do we decide uh what is the prior is it genetic is, is it being transferred from you know from generation to generation uh or uh it, it is it is developed from as a human so for that uh, i uh, she talks about an experiment where in which uh, so uh, in which the uh, and uh, a chicken from it, when it was born is put in a um, container and light is always shown from bottom so we always have this prior information that light always come, comes from top because of the fact that sun comes from top uh, the sun rays come from top so uh, so sh it was put in a container and uh, the rays were all, uh, the light was always coming up from bottom but the chicken uh, even then even after that uh, experiment the chicken always looked uh, kind of looked up which makes it uh, makes us question whether prior is something uh, you know uh, which we develop or it's something genetic and there is there is still not conclusive evidence to what it is to where the origin of prior is these are discussions that yeah, are i mean uh, the generative model like like this that they are like to so it's a bias towards uh seen distribution right? uh -huh. just so you have you know four classes and you just you know uh, divide by one by how many times you see them that is one i don't know i mean then you Relearn using posterior or some divergent theory. I don't know. This is an open question. So another interesting uh, historical experiment actually done by uh, you know Akbar at that time. So the same question: whether you know uh, language ability, speaking ability of language, speaking ability of human being is innate, coming from genetic ability, or people learn it. So to prove it, he made a you know very bad experiment. Uh, so he uh, gets some newly born three four you know kids and you know keep them separated with people who can't speak basically deep and dumb and keep them there for almost you know five years or so and nobody learn how to speak so uh, also uh, it's a very good experiment but you know that kind of experiment also you know they are even listed in the history so basically even if you have um Ability to learn innate, mm -hmm. uh, you require training. Without that, yeah. it's not going to, uh, you know, do that. And and um, I am guessing, uh, you know, most uh, experimental cognitive psychologists would say that, uh, you know, what you get exposed as a baby is what you're going to is going to inform how you're going to, uh, you know, how your brain is survive. Uh, I'm not sure they say that. They say. I think they they adopt the the Chomsky position. So there's a there's a kind of a blueprint that's got a bunch of bits in it, and when you are in your own culture and your own environment, you set the bits for how your language is going to be constructed. So the, the foundation is there, sort of like the schema is there, and then you just have to decide how it's substantiated for your your situation. So that's where example Regarding a newborn chicken in a field in the rear is three year old has black and white stripes vertical. And the chicken had never seen something like a uh, horizontal before. And the chicken grew up in that environment. And then they see the fire rate happening in their chicken brain. It never fired for a horizontal line after some period of time. Like it never worked. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, my hypothesis would be that. Uh, um, uh, if you're not exposed, uh, I, I guess it fits with emphasis, you know, that if you're not exposed to this, then your brain is not going to recognize that. And, you know, it's like people are, and the other very important thing that happens is that 
so much learning in multi model the parent says this is the name of the object dada this is mama this is what it is right so you can also be a label right you are you are getting two label and that's how the child gets it and then there's amazing ability to extrapolate and interpolate and all that stuff but um, some of the things are basis uh, you know new uh, things and then ability to automatically do the so not everything has to be labeled and not everything has to be said so that that is the you know this lack of clear understanding of exactly how how much you have to explicitly say versus how much they to just pick up and and yes you know it's like um uh, you may never have seen tank and uh, you suddenly you see tank uh, you understand that this has some different function so we must be sort of a combination of different languages and this happened a lot in the agricultural world of you know like the 1800s or something where you went for a whole bunch of labor from different communities and that language lacked syntax but it worked but it lacked syntax the next iteration the next generation will evolve a syntax a regularity and the concern there for this argument that you guys are making is there was nothing in the original environment that required syntax to develop but it does and that's called a creole so that yes and that's a very well established phenomenon it's going to work creole c r e o l e creole um so that's that's one comment that i would make and then the other comment that i would make is that there are lots of behavioral studies and i i kind of alluded to this when i spoke with you guys coming from the world of ethology or ethology where we show that no matter how often you expose a particular entity to bizarre contingencies if that entity doesn't have the predisposition to set up the relationship between that stimulus and response it will not be learned so a uh rat can learn to associate a, a food with illness but not for example and I don't, don't quote me on exactly what the dimension not a light with illness they can learn to associate a light with shock but not some other thing with shock so it does look like there are existing predispositions to form these associations and that's really hard to explain with a purely environmental explanation yeah that that is learned right that is not well that's that's a learning experiment but what is shown yeah. is you, that there's predispositions there's predispositions when you put people in not people that's we have to do this um at least not um there, there's predispositions to learn certain kinds of associations and it, it just doesn't seem to be determined by the environment try as you might you can't get that kind of learned response and the person associated with this actually took quite a bit of heat in the history of psychology because he was going up against the typical behaviorist explanations in like the 70s his name is john garcia love this paper it's called tilting at the paper mills of academia few few position from my side so uh, from the biology and anthropology side uh, people find out how species is the gene responsible for human branch 
and we will also find out at what time in our evolution actually clocks need to go on. So uh, there's a paper in Nature and Food Decade as well. It says that during the Neanderthal and Java time of the evolution of human race, uh, those genes are actually born. Before that, people probably did not have you know, the ability to speak and understand language. Uh, now, obviously, I mean, you might have the ability, but you don't know how to you know, polish that. So this is one, one fact. I, I don't know the exact condition, but it's good to have a look. And this, you know, learning capability. I mean, it's just an interesting fact. I used to, you know, code this uh, during my code mixing time and talks and etc. So I learned this in Europe. So there's a famous quote by an Austrian king. He said, I speak uh, German to gentlemen. I speak, uh, you know, the Latin to, uh, the, you know, worship or the you know, priest. I speak um, Russian to you know uh, hooligans. I speak uh, you know uh, Italian to girls and so on. So, on. so language has a kind of uh, societal identity as well. And as, as you know, Valerie says, you know the syntax learning and actually happens during your cognition and etc. So yeah, it's, it's good to look and you know how people develop these theories and how people connect those dots you know, in the learning process. Interesting, interesting thing. So I want to just add on the neuroscience level. Like I just want to give an example. Consider that you are driving daily to the work and your driving driving skills are like auto automated and you learn that your what is your route to your work and that becomes habitual. Now that will be like day to day, that will be the same route. Now you don't have to think longer about which turn you have to take or which corner you have to go or where is the red light. So this results in that you can you can be thinking about what meetings you have to take. You can dis like uh, you can uh, like you you can think about what you want to do the whole day and how you want to plan the day. So there is like attentive versus habitual action there in the way of neuroscience. So uh, people did this experiments, like I was reading this book and people did this experiment that uh, they are trying to see what is the effect in the prefrontal cortex and what part of the brain is engaged during the initial learning and learn, learning after, uh, like after, after learning that way. And they are showing this in virtual reality. So, uh, like the decisions which we make is limited on the uh, decisions with respect to the actual learning which we take and the next habitual action will be based on those past learning experiences. So like those studies uh, were uh, is that like prefrontal cortex is more engaged in the initial learning and then people just go by trial and error. That was the neuroscience view. Koshi, what is the paper you uh, commented? Uh, the post I made in the uh -huh. neuroscience you that you commented some language model paper in MRI. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk. So they were uh, 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 doing this experiment where they were uh, asking people to predict the next word and seeing how the neural activity, how much does it uh, match the activation pattern of a language model that is predicting. And it matched to a frighteningly high degree. <laughs> so uh, uh, that paper is support for the fact that uh, neural networks in the current form, uh, at least in, in the way that the wiring is connected in the brain, are may not be that far off. Not in how they compute things. But On the same line, I I read an abstract of the paper. There they discussed like uh, there they were showing some images, and they are capturing brain signals. Yeah. Then again, they give the same brain signals to the language model to see what it generates, and it generated the exact like, like exactly matching images of it, just using the brain signal, not like language. Yeah, that's a paper I, I posted in the neuroimaging group. Okay. You know, uh, if I'm in the comments, of course, you can mention this paper. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question that I always ask my students. So what would I say about that? about the two examples that you just gave me. You gave me a text example and you gave me an image example. And what would I say in comparison to the issues that are being discussed here? So, yeah, I would 
paper. We should discuss uh, that paper in, in detail. I, I am having a hard time um, understanding that uh, there is a description of uh, that something uh, in text uh, from the image that there can be re transforming the image. The reason is that I have is what I was discussing um, this morning with somebody. I used to teach uh, in a room and there was a, a picture. And I said, tell me, you know, what do you think about this picture? Uh, and uh, uh, you can, one person would say, well, picture is this object, you know, the cow is grazing or whatever. The other person would say, the picture has this texture and, you know, some other thing about painting style. The girl will say, oh, this is in this style of painting, impressionists and so on and so forth. The other will say, you know, this is a rare picture and uh, this will fetch hundred thousand dollars. See, it all, it all relates to the context. The same object, same scene, same, uh, you know, uh, sensory input would be interpreted in different contexts. Right? I mean, uh, the same data that the businessman looks at versus scientist looks at, they're looking for different things. Right? And thus, this whole thing about saying, oh, I can go from um, you know, image to text to image, it just doesn't make sense. Because there's no one context in which you can look at it. There's no way to complete and completely capture the context. There's no way to predefine all the possible contexts either. So I think that these are uh, sophistry. These are uh, poorly, uh, you know, constructed experiments that have a particular point of view that they are able to demonstrate, but uh, they won't stand up to the generality. In my view. But again, you should, you know, look at it or what they can say. There is a clear signature of a, <coughs> of a image that I can agree that there is a brain signal and that. Uh, uh, possibly the part of the brain that requires uh, are uh, you know the brain which is specialized on you know particular task and that that I can agree, but everybody is going to interpret those signals with different you know with their own context. We we, we interpret everything in our bias uh, with our the biases are due to our experiences, lifetime experiences, and each of us has unique experiences, right? So you know. Uh, I know a person who is just afraid of going to a downtown. And just whatever it is, is wired that way. And there's no sense why you know that is the case, but that is how it is. So um, uh, I, I think that yeah, physically there are similar things. Maybe the colors have the same uh, firing. Maybe uh, you know the density has the same firing, etc. But there's a big difference between the data. And the oh, data how it and it's interpretation, you know, contextual interpretation because we are, uh, you know, uh, you know, our, 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 our whole growth, lifetime of growth has a value, as a, uh, you know, uh, you know, impact uh, on anything that we end up doing, and that I don't see how much is Well, I'm 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 inclined to agree with you, but for sort of different reasons. I put image processing and text in the same class which is the interpretation of representations. And that is not the same thing as moving and behaving in a physical environment, which was one of the issues that was discussed here. It's just a different kettle of fish. And I think when it comes to the interpretation of representation, you absolutely have the contextual issues that Amit was talking about. The experiment that I mentioned, uh, uh, there's nothing about if a neural network understands me. Sure. It's only testing if uh, its wiring is in the right direction. Yeah, but it's so wiring for representations. It's wiring and only for a single, the single task of filling the blank. Yeah. So we have the humans to just predict the next word. They have the language model to do the same. Yeah. And the activation factors were similar. Latency was very different. Uh, so the only conclusion that they drew from that is that the connections in the neural network are maybe high to the to the brain. So that's for the interpretation of text. But as Amitabha said, 
you know, most of our evolution was actually not about the interpretation of text or images. It's, you know, about moving in the world. And, you know, I don't know what. Yes, you do addition on only So, come on, sir. So, the image experiment was uh, not the text and light connection. Quick, simple experiment. One image is shown to somebody. Then you go to MRI and you think about the image. I will capture your brain signal <coughs> and I will try to reconstruct what you are saying, what you are thinking. So, surprisingly, that reconstruction is quite good using stable It's very accurate. So, which is fascinating. So, now people don't know. How would you have to etc. That is one. Uh, second is this image uh, text uh, experiment, what is the stable diffusion value, etc. So, what happens is it will put a lot of data and it learns quite a few. I mean, earlier people used to think that this generalization is impossible. Now it is doing a great job. Obviously, there are pitfalls for the systems, etc. People will definitely work on that other science project. But um, surprisingly, the stable diffusion or etc. given a lot of data, to do a you know, phenomenal job. Yeah. So, so Dr. What... Das, Dr. Das, that paper they explicitly say that there is a lack of agree agreement regarding specific details of the reconstructed images. Okay, absolutely. But yeah. you know, if you see the visual, visuals are really intriguing. Yeah. So, so the point here is that. There are certain tasks, uh, uh, especially uh, in the example of you are seeing, uh, uh, being able to uh, transfer the modality and even across machine human boundary, they become very good. The other very, uh, I think, uh, good example is that uh, somebody who has lost the need to speak or something it just thinks and you can type, right? That is prone, that works. It's a technology that works really. So uh, here, something in the brain way is 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 possible to train a machine to capture those brain waves and convert them into exactly what the human thinks, right? So, but the, the 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 thing to notice that all the successes are in the case where there is nothing to do with understanding, nothing to do with interpretation, nothing to do with contextualization, right? So it's a task, and those tasks can be done very well. Even across human, uh, you know, machine boundary, that we have done very well, and these models, uh, each models, train on large thing have amazing ability to, uh, you know, repeat or apply, transform, you know, like as you say, transfer learning kind of thing. The amazing ability to do those kind of stuff, very very well. We got to give, you know, accept that, and then we got to say, well, what are these other things where there is a innate need for understanding. Interpretation, explanation, that's where our role comes. Doctor, when you were talking about context in the process, right now maybe you're just thinking about a high resolution context, but not like low resolution just now. But, but anything that I can see from context, you're not talking about that at all. No, I mean, I you give an example of writing, uh, you know, thinking and when you writing, is that the example? Um, a person thinks about uh, A and the machine writes A. Person thinks about B, machine writes thing. Person thinks about a word and machine writes word. That is not. And this other thing about creating images that are, you know, visually, uh, you know, quite high fidelity. Uh, that that is done. None of them requires, you know, context and interpretation and understanding. And abstraction, and that's where the uh, you know and, and the high level horology, not the low level of horology, but uh, those are the things where, and that's what the argument was. But you know, the whole paper, I mean, when you write a paper, and you can only write so much, and you can only uh, you know your ideas are translated into words only so much. But when you write the data and knowledge duality paper, that was the you know whole basically the framework that. Uh, there is something uh, different that you can do with all the data versus something for which you must have knowledge to provide the context. Uh, and, and there are other smaller things like that. But you look at that, there is a duality uh, argument is there. Uh, so, and also, you know, at least my, uh, whatever I have to offer in the neuro symbolic computing is all on that line. 
there are fundamental beliefs that there is a duality of data, uh, you know, and knowledge. Uh, and, and by that, there's more to it. There's more to experience, there's more to other things. But that you really have to have something out there, not the data, to provide appropriate context. You can create context in data, like clustering the cases, all the IR things and all that. You you that they, you can use the context there by you know creating vectors and all, but that is very coarse, and that is not that does not tie to the human interpretation, human understanding. Uh, it is uh, it remains at the data level. So uh, when we communicate the thoughts, uh, uh, I my belief you know this is uh, uh, that we communicate thought utilizing our knowledge. When we convey the thoughts, we are of course using a lot of statistical thing. Right? The, what the words the words come in, and uh, you know it goes from semantics to syntax as we as you know speak out what we are thinking. Right. So, um, but without the you know uh, the knowledge, uh, complex ideas for me to go from this topic to that topic, those things don't occur. Uh, they, they don't occur purely on st statistics because at that level there will be just too much noise and you know we don't have so much computing power in your brain to just you know make the things work with the too much noise that's also another uh, you know argument that um and philosophy basically or point of view that um computer can afford to be very um, uh, inefficient they can store a lot of data they can do a lot of computation they use you know uh, megawatts of power, you, you know, working on something like that. Brains uh, only use five watt of power or whatever that it does. And um, it has to be a lot more efficient. And to be the to efficient, you have to work at the high level of abstraction. Transferring opportunistically to the lower level of abstraction. You can't be doing everything at the low level of data level of abstraction. And that is why uh, you know, this duality is also very important, very efficient, uh, you know, things, the, the connection is uh, in, in this here, low level, uh, high dimensional kind of things. Okay, are done? Uh, okay, well done. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so then she, uh, she also talks about uh, the origin of reinforcement learning, how it was done, again done by uh, <coughs> cognitive scientists and uh, on and experiments. Uh, so the experiment was uh, like before. So there was a dog, and before giving the dog a uh, food, uh, we press a buzzer, and uh, uh, the we wanted to check whether the dog sal salivate or not. And uh, after a particular while, uh, like uh, even without the food, even even just pressing the buzzer, uh, the dog, started, which, which is like uh, it kind of understands that uh, reward and which comes along with that uh, buzzer. And so this this experiment later on uh, uh, led to a decade of uh, you know uh, research on rewards and cues and how they can use into. Uh, getting the how good and this leads to the reinforcement learning, which is the art of learning what to do without being told through rewards and fees. So um, one of the things she talked about was this uh, how it is being measured. There is the probability of response, which is like uh, which is this uh, thing that uh, like let's say uh, let's say you take a uh, dog off the street and the first time you Press a buzzer, uh, it does not understand it because it, it does not know that the reward is coming after it. So, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it, it doesn't celebrate. But the next time, every other time it does it, uh, the understanding uh, increases more and more. But the, the, the probability of response that is the uh, increase in the probability kind of reduces because now, now we have a um, understanding like there is a routine in which we know it is happening so uh so we know that this is going to happen so the probability that it uh understands reduces each time uh this is like we are saying uh, like uh, 
the sun rises in the uh, the sun rising uh, that is uh, that is like a very common phenomenon we don't get excited about that because it's a very uh, you know very uh, normal thing for us uh, so each time it happens we don't anticipate that we don't uh, see, uh, you know get that probability from so then she also talks about this uh formula dynamic programming and how it works uh, uh how it works and how the rewards uh how each time we make uh, you know a rational decision so that we can get an output uh which is like the most uh which gains the maximum reward and so uh, that's what is being discussed next and then she also talks about temperance temporal difference learning, which is like, um, which is this phenomena that you don't have to get the reward in itself to, uh, to gain, uh, understand it. But, uh, the pathway to it, uh, to the reward is, is also important. Let's say, um, uh, let's say the reward is you getting a cake, uh, in a birthday. So you don't have to get the cake in itself to, you know, get the understanding happening. But uh, the, if you hear someone sing uh, happy birthday or if you see a hat, that, it, that you know it's a pathway to the final reward, which is the key. So this is being discussed in, uh, in, in the book, uh, the temporal difference, which is being applied to a lot of uh, a uh, lot of algorithms like, uh, uh, you know, how the, how the uh, how a machine learns uh, uh, the game in itself, like tic tac toe. Like the final output is the reward. Like the final output is uh, you winning the game. But the pathway to it in itself, it, like every time you learn it, uh, this may this move gives you a uh, higher probability of winning the. That itself is important. How is that different from back propagation? Uh, it seems quite related to me. I mean, there's like there's a processing pathway, multi-layered network, and you get a reward at the at the end, and it feeds back into the network. No. Oh, yeah, that is I. So that's in in, uh, in in dynamic programming. Mm -hmm. The temporal difference learning is. A subset of dynamic programming and uh, creative research is a subset of temporal research. So it's just like any iterative of temporal okay. research. Temporal. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a, it's not equivalent. They're all in the same family. 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 Then she also talks about dopamine. Uh, we know dopamine as a pleasure molecule, which we see, and we learn a lot about dopamine, deep talks and things like that. But she talks about dopamine from a not from a pleasure molecule, but from a pedagogical one, which is that it signal errors needed for learning, whether it's positive or negative, which gets you like uh, it kind of. Uh, uh, Signals the temporal difference when, like whether whether we reach the uh, results or not. So in in the end of this uh, chapter, she talks about Mars level of analysis. Like we know we have learned from Dr. Sheldon about the three levels: computational, algorithmic, and implementation level. So in these three levels, uh, she says that reinforcement learning is one uh, is is one which kind of comes close to this Mars level of understanding. In that way, that computational, what, like what is the goal of the system, is maximizing the reward, and we have to maximize the reward. And algorithmic, what is the appropriate algorithm to achieve this goal, is this temporal difference learning, which we use to uh, achieve this goal. And the implementation, how is this algorithm being implemented, is through this document, which signals the error needed for learning. So she says that the uh, mass level of understanding is what every but every psychologist try for uh, at, to reach and this reinforcement learning comes kind of close to this mass level of understanding 
the final chapter talks about the theory of everything like uh, the hope that we get a grand unified theory uh, it uh, it like in physics we know uh, we are striving for a single uh, uh, force which connects all the gravitational uh, big force strong force magnetic everything together and here also we are kind of uh, he, she also is striving for a uh, you know single unified theory of brain but then there are problems associated with it because it's so complex that it is it worth pursuing for it ra rather than pursuing parts of the brain and understanding she also uh, talks about free energy principle which is this principle that a brain is constantly trying to minimize its energy by adapting to the changes so uh, so brain is trying to minimize the probability that it is uh it is predicting something and what is happening is kind of the same so it it needs to be same so it is trying to minimize its energy uh because if it is not same that the neurons getting fired is larger and we need to minimize the uh, minimize that so that principle is known as free energy principle and she talks about that and finally in the last two three pages of the book she also It's not minimizing the free energy. energy. Sorry. It's not minimizing the free energy. The energy. Free the energy. Free energy is a term in vibrational equations, and it means different from, let's say, energy at each individual. The free energy is a separate thing from energy. Okay. It's not energy. Okay. It's free energy. This is what. Talked about, so maybe I got it. Or she did. <laughs> It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you first said something about. Okay. So she's saying that in the capsule, it's bigger capsule. Free energy principle is uh, related to predictability of the price. So free energy in various industries, you want the probability distribution that is. More predictable. Than yeah, more. that's what that's what I meant. Like, uh, we want the prediction of uh, the brain uh, of what is we uh, see. It's a we want that to be minimized as much as possible. That's what you said. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In the final uh, two three pages, she talks about the. Talks about consciousness, and she says that now the brain could not be complete without exploring consciousness, and then she doesn't really explore consciousness. Uh, so, uh, so she only talks about two things. That is, one is integrated information theory, which is an attempt to define consciousness with an equation. So, uh, <coughs> she says that there we are putting forward several axioms uh, to define consciousness, but. Never really talks about uh, what those axioms are, and she also talks about phi, which is a which is a uh, equation which defines the consciousness. The higher the phi, higher consciousness. Uh, she never really talked about how this is formed and uh, what is the basis of this phi. And all. So I don't really and un I didn't really understand that much, and except for the fact that these are the terms that it uses. No, no equation, nothing. Uh, she just said uh, that phi uh, is what so phi uh, is what defines the consciousness, and whatever phi is, phi is. She just said that there is no uh, explanation of the whole thing. So you surrender with all of those theories and all those equations we had, and then you surrender. You said this. Very technically uh, heavy book. Yeah. And yet there is no uh, mathematical formulation of. Like the book. Like there is, uh, but except for the five, there is no mathematics. Uh, oh, five is one. Five, there is no mathematics involved, but then. <clears throat> but I really like the the relation, the analogy between reinforcement learning and mass development. Yeah, that was uh, pretty interesting. Although, do you remember what Posner said? Posner said machine learning has been preoccupied with the lowest level of analysis in Mars hierarchy. 
and he was concerned about that. So you haven't been inspired by some of the higher level cognition issues. And, and for us, the key is, in my view, understand the abstraction. Yeah. Understand that, that will do it. A lot of other people are thinking about it, but nobody has gotten anything further. So we are as early as we, anybody can be. I think I had a question or comment in the chat. I didn't see it pop up. Okay. Oh, I, I was just asking to Kaushik that he asked about free energy principle. Oh. Okay. He was, I think he was giving an analogy about free energy principle. Explaining it to the chief. Okay. I can explain if someone wants, I know what is free energy principle. Oh, what is it? Okay. So, um, so, so Carl Friston is some, like he's a neuroscientist and he defined free energy principle that uh, in the world of the senses and associated to perception, like the difference between the predictions and the mo and the model of the world. So he says that this free energy principle can be applied to understand the mental disorders as well as we can apply to artificial intelligence. So uh, in respect of artificial intelligence, what he talks that it have advantages of several uh, several methods uh, to understand like what is the model dynamics. Like uh, Mar Markov chain, um, uh, the Markov chain model and then we want to predict like how much of the maximum entropy or the Lee section or what were the medical grounds behind that and if uh, some model is making certain uh, category category of mistakes then how we can reduce those mistakes so it's a theory basically it's a theory and which which he is working from 2016 I guess and he's, he's been known as the father of dynamic causal modeling in the Bayesian environment of fMRI. Now that you bring that up, I, I will say that I, I was, for an ambitious project like this, it seemed to me that there's a control theory, cybernetics idea here that really ought to be better integrated for somebody that is this ambitious in, in trying to cover everything. Okay, uh, uh, well, 